The question has come up, how did Great Lakes freighters develop into the pilot house forward, engine cabins aft arrangement that became traditional? For those boat nerds out there who know the complexities of the long answer, please bear with me as I give the less complex answer and squeeze it into a seven minute video. Prior to bulk cargoes becoming the mainstay of Great Lakes maritime commerce, the primary cargo was people. The early lake propellers featured deck cabins for passengers and a lower cargo hold. Notice here that the engine and smokestack are located well aft and the pilot house is forward. Placing the engine aft had several advantages. First, the passenger accommodations and cargo hold were not interrupted by the engine and smokestack jutting up from the keel through the ceiling. Second, the propeller shaft could be far shorter, requiring fewer bushings and maintenance. Third, the majority of the sparks that sometimes came from the smokestack while the boat was underway would simply drop aft into the lake instead of onto the cabin roof. Thus, less chance of fire. Finally, less soot from the smokestack landed on the cabins and the people. The forward pilot house gave the captain an unobstructed view ahead, and most importantly, allowed for better hearing. When running in the fog in those days, all the captain had to avoid collisions or groundings was his ears, hearing the fog whistle from other vessels or signals from lighthouses were critical. Just prior to the Civil War, passenger traffic declined, and the best paying cargo became bulk cargoes, primarily iron ore. The problem was that the configuration of Great Lakes steamers was completely unfriendly to the efficient loading and unloading of those bulk cargoes. They would have to be barreled and wheeled aboard and unloaded in the same manner. Yet schooners with their hatches right on the deck were far more bulk cargo friendly. They were easy to load by gravity chutes and unload by overhead crane hoisted buckets. And that was their advantage. The disadvantage was that sailing vessels were dependent on the wind or steam tugs to move them anywhere. In 1869, longtime shipbuilder Eli Peck combined the advantages of steamers and sailing vessels. He constructed a boxy steam propeller that had the same deck top loading hatches as a sailing vessel. It was a matter of simply deleting the passenger cabins and using that open area for cargo hatches. This left the engine workings aft and the pilot house forward. His boat was christened the R.J. Hackett and was given a consort barge whose hull was nearly identical. She was called the Forest City. So successful was the Hackett's design that after just one full season as a tow barge, the Forest City was also given an engine. As you can see here, she took advantage of the overhead unloading systems of the era. Unwittingly, the Hackett Forest City's profile would become the standard for lake boats. By the 1870s, as the lumber boom began, old passenger propellers that could no longer turn a profit had their central cabins cut away and became what was called steam barges. They too had their pilot house forward and their engine works remaining aft. Granted, there were many wooden steam propellers that were built or modified with all cabins aft. These were called stem winders, or rabbit boats, depending on their exact configuration. Largely, however, the classic ore boat carried forward the laker lines of having the pilot house forward and the engine works aft with open space between for hatches. In 1892, the iron-hulled steamer Onoco entered service to widespread scoffing from those who believed that only wooden-hulled boats were safe. She ran for 33 years and sported the classic Laker lines. The vessel that really foretold what the looks of a classic Laker would be for the next 80 years was the W.D. Rees. She was launched on Monday, December 23, 1895. She was made of steel, and her pilot house 
was atop a fully raised forecastle. She had a clear spar deck with 11 hatches and a full aft cabin for her engine room and its crew. Of course, there were a lot of modifications that were tried. Beginning in 1892 with the launching of the Maritana, it became fashionable for some oar boats to have the forward cabins built on the spar deck between hatches one and two. No one is really sure what the exact purpose of this arrangement was for. But a number of oar carriers were designed that way, and it continued until 1901. Another trend was to remove as many of the deck houses as possible, supposedly clear the way for unloading equipment. This fad reached its zenith with the launching of the Augustus B. Wolven. It came out in the spring of 1904. Seen here, she has no upper cabins at all, other than her pilot house and the adjoining captain's cabin. This configuration was known as submarine decking. And it must have been hell in the summer, as crews had only a porthole, a few vents, and a couple of skylights for fresh air while locked inside a steel ship. By 1906, the outline of a laker settled into a pattern that would become standard. One of those early oar boats was the William E. Corey, seen here. That standard held true until 1974, when the Algo Sioux was launched. She was the last vessel launched on the Great Lakes with the standard configuration. Thereafter, all Great Lakes vessels had their accommodations placed aft. The most prominent expression of the classic Laker lines is the first 1,000-footer on the Great Lakes, the Stuart J. Court, which was launched in 1971. 